Hi, Charlie. Dad, how's it going? Um, it's going well. It's going well. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Common Good Cocktail Guide. Um, special guest is the Doug Wright, President, CEO of Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. Yeah, co-founder. Uh, my, co my, you know, <laughs> yeah. Namesake. All, yeah, all those uh, work for me. So, well, wonderful. Uh, so, Charlie, I've I've had the pleasure of of uh, knowing you uh, for gosh, what what is it now? When was the first day you walked into the inn at Longman, talking about your new distillery you were starting up? Yeah, mm -hmm. gosh, it's probably been yeah seven eight years. That's crazy. Um, yeah, that time flies. Uh, uh, yeah, I I feel like I could tell your story by memory, but I think it'd be a lot uh, cooler to hear it from you. Do you mind telling us a little bit about like how you got started? Yeah, totally. It all started in 2006 um, on my way with my dad and my brother to buy a quarter of a cow worth of meat from a butcher. All right. <laughs> and, good, good journey. Um, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought that we were just going to pick up some meat and, and on our way to this butcher, we were running low on fuel and we stopped to fill up. And at this gas station, there's this historical marker that says Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, one mile east on Long Branch Road. Charles Nelson opened the Greenbrier Distillery. We're like, holy crap, what is this? You know, go on to the butcher, lives a mile east, ask him if he knows anything about the old distillery. And he's like, well, hell, you know, look across the street. We did see this old barrel warehouse that's uh, pictured here. Mm -hmm. Hard to see, but it was oh, no, still standing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, an original spring still running. And uh, we dragged from the spring and then he sent us to a nearby historical society where there were two original bottles of Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey with my name on. Them. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, my gosh, what is this? And at that you point, know? you had you had no idea why your name would be on a bottle of whiskey. Right. That's right. crazy. Um, and so um, I didn't know at that point that uh, up until that point that my family had a history in the whiskey business. I, I always knew the story of my family coming to America in 1850 uh, because there was a story like my dad always told the story of how uh, my family uh, on their way on the journey over um, the the patriarch had the family's fortune in gold sewn into his clothing, and he was knocked overboard ultimately and and taken to the bottom of the Atlantic with the family's fortune in gold. Um, oh. And so, like, we didn't believe that story uh, growing up, um, but it turns out it actually was true. And um, we we got like um, this lady, Dory Vilsnack, reached out several years ago with an article from the New York Herald from 1850 detailing the journey over. And um, then, you know, and we found old obituary. It turns out it actually did happen. Um, That's crazy. Um, but yeah, and, and so my great, great, great grandfather, Charles Nelson, you know, arrived in New York in 1850 with nothing but the clothes on his back and made soap and candles in New York for a couple of years, moved to mm -hmm. Cincinnati, became a butcher. Mm -hmm. And then um, around a little before the start of the Civil War, moved to Nashville, started a wholesale grocery business where he was one of the first to bottle and sell whiskey rather than selling it by the barrel or the jug. Okay. Bought the distillery that was producing his whiskey, expanded it and became one of the largest distilleries in the country prior to prohibition. And what about what year was this that this was going on? Uh so like between 1860 and 1909. So wow. just as an example in 1885 um we were selling about 380,000 gallons a year which is nearly 2 million bottles a year um which is it's kind of crazy. So much. Um I know it's a lot more than we're doing now. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was mostly of our, our signature, you know, the Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey. Um, sure. And we're using like the original label, original recipe, everything like that for for that. But 
Uh, he did also produce Bell Mead bourbon, which is why we came out with that brand. And sure. Um, yeah. But then ultimately shut down because of statewide prohibition in Tennessee in 1909. Oh, and that, that was before other prohibition laws hit. Uh, yeah. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So Tennessee was unfortunately an early adopter in that, in the, you know, what I think is, uh, you know, when it's not the best thing to be an early adopter. Right. Um, yeah. But I think, I think we're all on the same page with that, with, with prohibition. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, original recipe, um, uh, did, did Tennessee have the same sort of regulations about how to produce it? Has, uh, I mean, would you, do you mind speaking into like, uh, how you even like found the, the recipes, how you recreate it. Is anything different that you do today that you like know of versus like what they did back then? Yeah. So um, we're using the original recipe for Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee right. whiskey, not for Bell Mead bourbon. We did not have the original recipe for Bell Mead. Sure. Uh, we okay. had the original label and we knew that there was rye used. Um, and we actually had three expressions of Bell Mead, a, a bourbon, a rye, and a Tennessee whiskey. And okay. so anyway, it was sort of inspired by the original. Cool. Uh, for our Nelson's Greenbrier uh, brand, we we actually, back in the day, I think had like seven or eight different versions of it. And we have a couple different original recipes, mash bills at least, um, that um, we found in old newspaper articles. So it, it wasn't like neatly packaged as like here is the recipe you know um but after we discovered um you know those bottles you know on our way to the butcher and everything uh spent a couple years in state and county archives um and okay. you know like on the little microfiche where you put like a you know right a coin in like a quarter dime or whatever and yeah. you know look at the old newspaper articles and so I basically just went through a lot of old newspapers um, and we advertised in the newspaper in many newspapers just about every day. And there were articles written about the distillery all the time. And on the 4th of July, there would be these big uh, to do's big gatherings mm -hmm. um, at the distillery. And it was like the who's who of Nashville society would, would go up, there'd be a big picnic and barbecue mm -hmm. and, you know, music and sorry, I'm going into a lot of detail, but I know it's great. I, can, I love it. Carried away I, I, can, a little I bit. can picture the scene. Yeah. And and actually, so folks would even come down from Chicago to come oh, to wow. this. It was it was like a big deal. And um, so anyway, they would have a tour at the distillery. And there's a guy, Mr. Bollinger, who's sort of like the right hand man of production. Um, he took a group through a tour of the distillery and he went through the whole process step by step saying, you know, like first we grind up 103 bushels of corn and cook it to 212 degrees. Then we cool it down and add in 28 bushels of wheat and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, and so there was a, there was a journalist um, in the group who wrote it down. And then published it the next day and Gold. in a newspaper. <laughs> yeah. And um, there, there's another article that a similar situation where it was like a visit to the prosperous concern of Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, where they mash twice daily using X number of bushels of corn, uh -huh. Y number, you know, and just, and so like we were able to kind of back into it a little bit and, um, you know, it was, it was interesting when we saw that we, we used wheat, Back in the day, mm -hmm. um, right. uh, we did use rye and we made some rye whiskey as well, but we grew a lot of corn and a lot of wheat in the area. Uh, so it makes sense that um, that that would that you would use, you know, what you're growing a lot of. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of whiskey historians, one of my one of I think the, the interesting points to me in, in your uh, in your history was uh, an article that was published early on. Uh, was it in the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal? Yeah, uh, <laughs> actually, I think I think that was published the day that I was with y'all in Chicago. I remember because that was right around Whiskey Fest, and I remember your reaction to it. Um, do you mind sharing with us like what uh, what you thought about it, what the article said? I mean. 
you know, we're freaking out uh, because we have just we we learned that the Washington Post is writing an article about us and mm-hmm. and our distillery and. We thought that like with our rich history, we thought that it was going to be just all about the history and how great it right. is and and everything like that. And um, and, you know, like we were talking about, we were very open, honest and transparent about everything. And but we we thought that this was just going to be kind of like a fluff piece about our history. And this was, sure. you know, we were still trying to raise money to build our distillery. Right. Um, and kind of a fragile entity at the time. And um, so the article comes out and it was all about basically sourcing. And- Because this is um, right around the time of, uh, am I mistaken, like uh, all of that information about like maybe Templeton and maybe other brands that were like sourcing without disclosure. uh, There was a, a general like sense of like maybe rage about what some distilleries were doing without disclosing their information. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It, it was right about that time. It actually, this was actually like leading up to that time. I think this was okay, sure. maybe a little bit before. Well, sure, it, it, yeah. right around the time anyway. Sure. Um, yeah, and so it was, you know, a really tough time for us. And so, and there was a, a big whiskey writer uh, who apparently was interviewed uh, for the article, and we didn't know about it, who said um, basically that we have a flawed business plan and that it will, you know, never work. And so, like, I was devastated. I thought that we were done for. I, I thought, like, you know, we're still trying to raise money. And I was like, nobody's going to invest now. Like, one of the biggest, you know, whiskey you know writers and Mm -hmm. most knowledgeable in the industry said that we have a flawed business plan it can't work and uh so i was pissed man i was devastated and um and i was actually i was scheduled to have an interview uh with like the chicago tribune that day and um i was hot you know and i went into that and and they started asking you know they had obviously read the article as well and so they started asking questions about it's like look i'm i'm an open book here i'm gonna be honest about this but look if you're trying to do like an expose here find somebody else like we're not trying to hide anything like I, i i if you want to talk about the history and you know everything like that then let's let's talk but if you want to just say that we are not doing things right or say that we have a flawed business plan or or something like that then find somebody else and and like for, for the information for like someone who's watching they're like I don't understand why anyone would say a, a, a new distillery or company would have a, a flawed business plan uh to sort of fill everyone in one of the one of the concerns or complaints at that point that was swirling around was like there, there's a massive distillery in Indiana and there's other distilleries that part of their business plan is selling their whiskey to other people to be bottled according to their own specifications and selling it with their own labeling and brands. And uh, there are some like large name brands. I, I had just mentioned one that like kind of took a big hit because uh, they had talked about it being a prohibition era whiskey that was like, I think, ma- I don't know if they said made in Iowa, but like they really promoted that on the label. Um, and so they were taking a lot of flack from it. And so there was that swirling question around like, okay, is it cool? Is it okay to do this source whiskey thing? Like, uh, does that mean it's less quality? Does it mean it's like some, a brand that we shouldn't support? And I, I know at least for myself, like that was a really big, uh, a question we kept getting from guests at that point. And we were huge fans of Bellmead from the beginning. I always tell people like, if you want an example of what, like why source whiskey, uh, can be like an amazing uh, thing that you can enjoy, like Belmead is was and is still like a prime example of of why like you can have amazing you know MGP bourbon and uh, under like another brand that's that's exceptional and it can be like a good value and uh, definitely worth supporting and drinking. Yeah, for sure. I uh, appreciate that. Our our plan all along was because we couldn't afford to buy all the equipment and build out the distillery up front. 
that uh, my family and I, we put up literally everything that we owned to personally guarantee a loan to get started sourcing barrels, you know, working with MGP, then known as LDI, mm -hmm. uh, to create, you know, our unique sort of blend of two different mash bills and two different yeast strains for Bell Mead. And mm -hmm. in essence, kind of prove the concept and show that we could you know, create a, a brand and, you know, a good quality product, sell it, um, get it on the market and everything. Uh, and then that was meant to be sort of a bridge to then raise money, build out our own distillery and start distilling, distilling our Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey. And so fortunately, our business plan actually has worked pretty well. Which I'm, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful for. Because like, what's the alternative for a distiller? And we see this all the time. You see distilleries start up, they, they can't wait to get their bourbon out there, but good bourbon uh, takes a, a right amount of time, a good amount of time in the right size barrels to age. And when you're releasing it young, uh, before it's ready, or when you're making improper cuts, because you need to like make the bottom line work, you're releasing inferior product. And I, that's one of the things that I actually really appreciate about, uh, about you guys. You, you took the time. I think, I think sourcing it is a great way to get to that point where you're releasing whiskey when it's ready to be released. So I have a lineup in front of me and, and uh, there are a couple things here that are becoming more common, but I think are still like kind of unique. Uh, and so we have a, a, a few finished products and some of them are, are pretty rare and I, I, I love them and I'm proud of them. Uh, but uh, could you talk about finishing, finishing a barrel? Uh, like wh why would you do that? Uh, what notes do they bring? Like what are you hoping the final product uh, should taste like? Yeah, so um, as as far as sort of how we got into the the finishing of mm -hmm. um, you know our Bellmead line, um, it kind of goes back to the whole sourcing thing. Like you know, as sourcing was becoming more common uh, in the marketplace, and and more brands were you know coming out. Um, we wanted to make sure that we stood out from the crowd and that we were putting our fingerprints uh, on the product and doing something a little bit different and unique from what everybody else was doing. Mm -hmm. And so we, we started talking about how we could sort of, um, you know, take things to a, another level. And we looked at sort of scotch and, and the scotch industry and, and, you know, we were talking, we were like, well, they use a lot of sherry casks. Um, why don't we try and source some sherry casks and finish some bourbon in there? And we, because we had never heard of any bourbon finishing in sherry casks. So um, we experimented with, you know, some different sherry casks and like ultimately narrowed it down to either Oloroso or, or Pedro Jimenez, sure. um, decided ultimately on the Oloroso sherry cask and uh you know each each cask yields different flavor profiles and stuff but generally speaking you know I get like a little bit like fruity floral and nutty notes I, I I'm really looking forward to tasting them through if, if you if you don't mind uh yeah uh, uh tasting through with me uh uh just to kind of give a guest and I an idea of what they might taste like we're going to start with uh the, the Nelson's Greenbrier, your, your, your wheated uh, recipe. It's uh, corn, it's wheat and malt and barley, nothing else, there's not a fourth grain in there. Correct, yep, and that's right. Uh, do you, uh, are you able to talk about like aging process, age, things like that? Yeah, I mean, um, so this is um, currently 75% four and five year old and 25% three-year-old. So oh. when we um, when we expand, you know, like nationally with this brand, mm -hmm. it will all be at least four years old. But cool. um, we, you know, we really like the, you know, taste profile as is. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's kind of like getting it all to, to four years old is is a bit of a, for you sure. know, just one of those turtles. And so uh, we we have barrels as old as, I guess, um, six, six and a half years. 
And we're, we're going to be setting some back to age a little bit longer. We may do a couple other expressions, um, but it is um, it's 91 proof because uh, Charles Nelson passed away in 1891. So okay. uh, everything we do, we try and have a, a reason behind it. Um, yeah. And by the way, I, I think that we'll probably be getting into Illinois next year with it yes that was one of my questions i was gonna say for later i'm so glad to know that that's that's wonderful yeah that's i mean really don't good. don't don't like hold me to that 100 sure. I, I i think so i mean um anything can I, happen we've just experienced 2020 i get yeah, it. exactly <laughs> exactly um but yeah and, and this is this is like what we want to take over the world with so mm -hmm. we're pricing it at a you know reasonable mm -hmm. price point like you know, on the shelves, it's generally around twenty nine ninety nine. You know, I, I want people to do with it, or or just drink it however they enjoy whiskey. Whether that's neat on the rocks in a cocktail, you know, cool. mix it however you like. Um, I just want people to enjoy it, and it's at an affordable price point so that you can do that and not feel guilty if you're, you know, making a, a cocktail or something. Cool. And and this is, uh, so it says, uh, Nelson Screenbuyer, Tennessee, handmade sour mash whiskey qualifies as bourbon? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's also a Tennessee whiskey? Yeah. So, so it goes through the charcoal filtration process? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. So obviously we didn't have like the original yeast strain. Um and that we're we're doing the charcoal mellowing a little bit different than okay. they did. They had probably uh, a little bit bigger vats and everything. And and honestly, their distillery was bigger than ours back in the day uh, uh, than ours is currently. Uh, sure. So we're our charcoal mellowing tank is a just a, a barrel um, that we've packed full of sugar maple charcoal, basically charcoal from sugar right. maple wood um sure. it's basically like a giant brita filter um and so we're, we're not super aggressive with our charcoal mellowing yeah and oh also the the label that we're using i think i mentioned this is almost exactly the same as the original and uh we actually took a bottle an original bottle and did a 3d scan of it mm -hmm. um to create this bottle mold and we added That's some cool. minor embellishments, like we thickened up the base a little bit, sure. and we added um, we added this. Back in the That's day, so we were cool. known as Old Number Five because we okay. were registered distillery Number Five. Sure. The federal government recognized that and gave us an historic designation. It's hard to say. Wow. ESP oh. Five, Distilled Spirit Five, awesome. TN Tennessee Five. So. That's um, really cool. Yeah. That's super cool. Can we go on here to uh, what might be one of my favorite? uh favorite bourbons i've had uh in in years so this is my last this is my last amount of this for my personal collection at home uh do you remember when we picked this one out this uh 10 year bell mead single barrel gosh um y'all were one of the first to get to pick out a single barrel period um and I mean, it was probably what six years ago, five years ago, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's 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 uh, yeah, it's five or six. And I, I just remember sitting in that room, and I remember we were like ta uh, smelling, tasting through all the barrels. And we got to this one, and all of us were like, "Oh man, oh man!" I remember like you you had an outburst, and uh, you were like, "That might be one of the best barrels that I've ever tasted out of this." <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we were just we were just. This is it's 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 a beautiful expression. Onto one that I've never tried before. I've never even smelled it. I poured it in the glass, and I haven't even like the the black bell. I remember you posting about this, and I remember reading about it before it came out, and now I have it here in front of me. Can you tell us a little bit about this black bell? Yeah. So the black bell is um, a collaboration that we did with a local brewery in Nashville, um, Blackstone Brewery. Cool. Every year they make an imperial stout and then age it in our used Bellmead bourbon barrels. And they, um, you know, were like, hey, why don't you guys, you know, do something, like maybe distill some of the beer or, you know, finish some of your bourbon in the barrels afterwards. And we were like, 
we tried distilling some of the beer and it was funky sure. um and it was like it was something that was like it was cool to take a sip of but not something that you necessarily want to you know right. have more than one glass of at least right and so we we tried finishing uh two barrels uh with bourbon in them um for about a year and after that it was just like oh my gosh this is killer and they were both very different but uh -huh. um so that turned into something that we do on an, on an annual basis and um this is the most recent offering and uh we i think we did like four or five barrels this year so what proof is the one that you're drinking uh 110.1 okay mine's 111 so mine's going to be a little bit different but sure. similar i mean like i get some like you know a little bit of chocolatey yeah, almost absolutely. like coffee and like yes. raspberry notes a fun different you know delicious like fun, yeah. <laughs> delicious like the, it, it it is uh robust and i can i can feel the heat it gives me a i mean shall i say a tennessee hug as it like yeah. goes down but it, <laughs> it it does not on the palate it doesn't taste like it's 110 yeah. uh at least for uh mine here and it's got i it's it's got a rich robust like viscosity but it, it's not uh it's it's still clean on the palate like you sip it and you want some more uh, there are some yeah. like uh, uh stout finished uh whiskeys um that I'm not a fan of, I think for that reason, I just, you take one sip and you're like, I'm good, that was good, I'm yeah. good. This is fantastic. Yeah. And I think maybe the proof contributes to that. So um, it really smart yeah. on this, it's really amazing. This is not sold in Illinois. Will, will it ever be? Um, I mean, hard to say, but it, it's, it's probably gonna be distillery only for sure. the foreseeable future. So for me, the next one in line is a Madeira. Uh, cask strength finished in Malmsey casks. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, after, after we experimented with the sherry cask, mm -hmm. um, then we started going, um, you know, venturing out a little bit more. And um, we then were like, Hey, what if we did it with the cognac cask finish? Mm -hmm. And so we did that and it was, I loved it. Um, that's and then we're like, me. <laughs> yeah. And then we're like, well, what about a Madeira cask? And so we were just trying to do stuff that like, we didn't know of anybody else doing them. I, I later found out that there were a couple other, actually, I think at Longman, I found uh, one yeah. other cognac cask finish mm -hmm. or maybe two. Um, but uh, then, um, then we did the Madeira cask. Um, and so they're all just like unique. And then we've done a very limited amount of like single barrel expressions of them. And, and what you have are, are expressions that, um, uh, the, the single barrel versions of them that were only available, um, at the distillery. And actually, I think, I think that we still have some left. We haven't really like promoted those very much. We just kind of like had them as a special treat in the distillery. If you, if you come by and, um going to the gift shop you know what's nice about this uh it's like on the nose like and, and like right away i just it. it's got this like figgy pudding sort of like it's got these really nice like holiday like fruits and spice like almost like a fruit cake sort of thing going yeah. on yeah with, with so, good must so i i call it i describe it as like a a candy coated peppercorn you get okay. like this like yeah. you get some of these like sweet candy you know almost i think fruitcake is a good way to describe it too in a good way <laughs> um, right fruitcake yeah. is a bad rap but good fruit yeah <laughs> um but then i i think that you still get at the core some of that you know pulled peppery rice spice yeah. a little bit there yeah. too so yeah it really finishes with that spice it's, re it's really pleasant yeah it's fantastic all right, cognac. What 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 can I expect from this one? There's the XO um, cognac cask. Yeah, so this one, I mean, the the regular version is is gonna be, you know, uh, out of the cask finishes, a little bit lighter and brighter. Um, you know, 
like vanilla creme brulee, uh, uh, little like citrus, orange citrus sort of notes, still get a little bit of that spice. This version is going to be a little bit like on steroids, a little bit, you're going to get more of that spice. It's, mm-hmm. it's a bit more of a beast. I also get a little like almost orange marmalade sort of yeah but like you get you know that uh like a, still some of that peppery rice spice um and I I actually this may sound weird but I love having this with like uh different cheeses oh sure um, and uh, like a charcuterie board you know just some cured meats and cheeses and maybe some almonds and you know, mixed nuts on the side. Um, that sounds great. That sounds and, really great. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, really nice. Yeah, for 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 myself, like, yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those vanilla notes come through, like, yeah. like Madagascar vanilla bean. We've been working with vanilla beans uh, a lot, even though the price is ridiculous right now for some of our fall and winter cocktails. And and th- this smells like when we put uh, vanilla bean in a, in a in a boil, like you know, you slice it down, you put it in a boil, something. It, it's got that really rich uh vanilla that's 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 really nice um yeah moving on to the sherries we got we got two sherries we have we have first your standard sherry cast strength which is nothing standard about it uh and then our uh longman pick uh i shouldn't say our anymore the, the uh formerly of longman so uh yeah the, the, the pick that i did when i was still at longman um that i still get a little bit of slack from uh I, I think that uh when when we picked this one out, I uh I, I think there's a, a little bit of people uh people's reaction kind of being like, why would you do something so weird? I was like, because we have all these <laughs> I think we had like 22 barrel selections at that point still on our shelves. And I was like, well, this one is different than them all. I'll get to that one in a moment, uh, because I still have a very visceral like memory of how that tastes. I'm really curious to see yeah. how yours departs from that. Yeah, so uh, so this one, the the non uh, you know longwind pick no, was no, no. Uh, th- this one's you know maybe a little bit more in line with just like the standard or you know the the regular uh, sherry cask, but again kind of on steroids. Getting some of those dark stone fruit notes, uh, I still get some of the the nuttiness there's a, a fun memory associated with this my dad whenever we would go to a movie theater as a kid he'd always get like junior mints and he'd get raisinets uh like the milk chocolate covered yes and and that is what this is to me milk totally. chocolate covered raisinets. i would i was actually i was trying to think of that and like i'm glad you said that i was for some reason i was thinking goobers but like what are goobers <laughs> I don't know. To finish off here, the the longman pick. I I just remember the umami and funk, and this is so oh, yeah. palpable. Like the seaweed in here, because <laughs> of all these cast strength whiskeys have been sipping on. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, this one, this one is it's it stands oh. apart. I mean, it's it's like you said. There's that umami, the the seaweedy. You know, the it's it's funky. It's different. It's it's unlike any other <laughs> that. Yeah, you know. I mean yeah. that is that is a seaweed wrapped dark chocolate bar. Like, <laughs> it's like layers of dried salted seaweed you get like you know at an Asian supermarket and like just layered on top of like like four or five layers on top of a little thin dark chocolate bar. Yeah, and you just eat it together. It's so good, man. I love this so much. But it is so so markedly different. This this is smooth. This kind of punches you in the face with its like um i don't know beautiful strange flavors yeah um, it is it is it is a beautiful stranger um and it's it can be polarizing you know um but it's it's i think it's especially cool for you know folks who are you know past like the just like the the beginner stage of your you know uh whiskey drinking yep uh career yeah um, what's this see what like a, a crazy like oloroso sherry influence can do to a bourbon this is this is that like it's yeah really got that um i i know we're running short on time here we've already gone over by a, a good hefty chunk I, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to to talk 
uh, about yourself, your family's history, your distillery's history with me to, to help me taste through a lot of your beautiful products. And you've got so many others to offer. Uh, I can't wait for this to come to the Illinois market and anything else that comes here, we will uh, we'll eat up, drink up. Um, so thank you again uh, for the time and uh, just for your also just uh, friendship and all the hospitality that you've shown me over the years uh, w whenever you uh, come to Chicago and also just um, at at your own distillery in, in Nashville. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, man, I, it's good to see you, first of all, and um, hope to hope to get to hang out in person before too long. I, I, it's been way too long since I've been up to Chicago area. Um, and, you know, appreciate you having me on and for, you know, the support over the years and the hospitality that you've shown to, to me and, and my brother and our, you know, team um you you've uh, always been a a good friend and and good supporter and and you know uh just really appreciate it because um you know that's that's what this business is all about you know building relationships and you know getting to know one another a little bit better and and hopefully providing a, a little bit of joy in other people's lives and and um you know, uh, it's tough out there. So a, a, a little, uh, little joy is, is, is good to have from time to time. So. Absolutely. I agree. Well, uh, you have a wonderful rest of your day, holiday season year. So it's coming to a close here soon. And yeah, we, we, we hope to see you again soon.